as I'm sure you recall, the word on the blackboard for chapter 7, this lecture that Lacan delivers on the 12th of May, 1971, is literatere. It's a word that you may have seen before, especially if you read French and you look at the front end of Lacan's other decree. This lecture became a short, dense essay. And a lot of what is happening here, Lacan distills and sometimes says even better in that particular essay. So I thought, why not? If he takes this lecture and turns it into an essay, in other words, gives it another turn, maybe we can give our last lecture, our commentary on chapter seven, one more turn. And I think it might be the turn that adds some clarity in spots where we were moving very fast in that lecture. What had me thinking was the question of line versus curve. Recall how we set this up. Nature is the field of the curve, the universal curvature, as Lacan calls it, and scientific inquiry of the most radical sort, psychoanalytic inquiry, is at the level of the line, the straight line, that measures the appearance of the curvatures in nature, known as symptomatic expressions. This is more or less what we were up to, and I've been thinking about these curves and wondering how best to represent this, especially given what we know about this littoral zone that is so central to what's happening in Chapter 7 of Seminar 18. So we're thinking curvature, curved lines, especially when the unconscious is involved. Between knowledge and jouissance, we said, is the littoral, whose lines are curvy and always curving toward the literal, toward the letter. The question then becomes, how do you represent this, especially in light of what we know from a very basic beginning, what the littoral zone means? Think to some classic diagram work that you've seen in mid to late Lacan, the work that tends to begin around seminar 11 and continues where you see circles laid atop one another. A Euler diagram, these Eulerian spheres that are overlapping and that create something that looks a lot like this. If you're just listening and not watching this and not seeing the diagram I'm holding up, imagine taking two circles and pushing them together so that they overlap a bit and create a zone that is shared, that is intersectional between them. This is a great way to understand what Lacan is doing here. And I owe this to Eric Laurent, total badass, really interested in his work always. He has also tackled this issue. And although I don't agree with everything he says about how this unfolds, I love all the moonscapes that he gives us by working this through the Eulerian diagram, so classical in Lacan's thought, and also in his commentators. You see Bruce Fink also making great use of these overlapping circles. What I wanna do is borrow that diagram, but use it to talk about high tides and low tides, this littoral zone. In other words, I want to read what Lacan is saying about the littoral literally. I want to envision him not talking about rivers coursing through Siberian landscapes, although that is relevant. I want to read him as talking about coastlines, littoral zones between the sea and the land. And that's how we can label these two circles. If you've got your paper and pen in front of you and you've drawn these two circles, label the left one sea and the right one land. On the left is the sea. This is the field of jouissance. On the right, you have land. This is the field of knowledge. Now, the next move is the wildest one. Now what I want you to do is take the basic topography of Lacan's theory of discourse, this four-footed animal plus the delta of impotence, and I want you to plug it in to these two circles, such that on the left side, out to sea, you have agent, 
over truth, the left side of Lacan's four-footed topography of discourse. And on the right, in the circle known as land in the field of knowledge, <clears throat> other over product, which raises the question, what are we going to put in this intersectional zone where the two circles have overlapped? Why, first, the horizontal arrow of addressivity stretching from agent to other at the upper level of this discourse theory, and underneath it, the delta of impotence. This squares readily, as you can see, with what we have already done with these Euler diagrams earlier in this series, where in this delta of impotence in the middle, we located the sexual law as a prohibition against anything like the sexual rapport, namely sexual jouissance, namely wholeness, completion, and the like. So we're not too far from where we've already been. Take these two circles, overlap them, label one side C, the field of jouissance, the other side land, the field of knowledge, and in between what we have is the littoral zone. The littoral zone is the coastal zone between sea and land. And like the diagram in front of you, it also has two edges. On the right side, where the sea swells furthest into the land, this is the high water mark. This is high tide. So already we're complicating this. High tide is where you see the sea swelling furthest into the land. And that's represented by the right-hand extension of the circle here labeled C, jouissance. And you can already know what we're going to put on the other side. When the sea recedes furthest from land, exposing the furthest land that we can see at the beach, that's called low tide. And so what you have here in this diagram is you have the sea on one side, land on the other. Here's the circle of the sea. Here's the circle of land. When the sea swells to its fullest point, extending furthest inland, you have high tide. That's what this aspect or dimension of the sea represents. When the sea retreats to its lowest point, you have low tide. That's what this element represents. So it is important that you see this, and it's going to become important that you see it overlaying Lacan's basic theory of discourse, where in the field of the sea, jouissance, you fundamentally have truth. And in the field of land, the field here known as knowledge, you have what is produced in any given discourse. The question is going to become, what does this look like at high tide? What does it look like at low tide? But first, I want to get us back into this liminal zone in between, known as the littoral zone, this intertidal zone between high tide and low tide. As always, though, we've got to earn it. So let's start first with a little more review adding to what you have in these two circles. Truth in the field labeled C equals sexual enjoyment in the real. Now, it's more complicated than that, as you heard in the last lecture. Always this sexual enjoyment in the real as fantasized from the shore of the symbolic. But on the side of truth, for purposes of clarity and coherence, we can write sexual enjoyment in the real. On the right-hand side, in the right-hand circle, product, what is produced here on land, in the field of knowledge, surplus enjoyment in the field of society, in what we know as the symbolic. So what you have is on the side of C, jouissance, sexual jouissance, in the real. On the other side, in the right-hand circle, land, you have knowledge. Among its basic products, 
is the opportunity, occasion, and objects characteristic of surplus enjoyment, always in the field of the symbolic, in the field of the other, if you really want to start messing with this. Because don't forget, the barred subject could be on the left-hand side in the sea, and the other would be on the right-hand side up on land. Now, we're working to the liminal zone in between this littoral zone. But what I want to first start getting us at are these curvatures that form the littoral zone. And I'll tell you what got me thinking about this is not the work of Eric Laurent. What got me thinking about this is just checking out the ocean. In fact, I found myself the other day, the other night, on a night hike down at a beach not in my neighborhood, but across the bridge. It's a wild one. Cliffs, waterfalls, weirdness of every sort. And what I noticed was, this was a steep, sloping beach. And when the waves came in, they came in not straight, but at a kind of parabolic shape. The depth of the wave at high tide was like the top of a parabola, a parabolic arc. The waves didn't come in straight, but they came in as an arch, which is exactly what got me thinking about this high tide mark. The waves don't just come in straight, as you're seeing with this pen. They come in instead with some depth at the center and some shallowness at the sides, creating, in effect, a curved high tide line. And I stuck around at this beach for a minute. I waited till it got dark, but I could still see as the tide receded and I could see that the low tide mark was also not a straight line, but instead created a low tide or a low water line that was curved, curved out, bowed out into the Pacific Ocean. Not a straight line, but a bowed line, another inverse parabolic, where at the center, the, the land intruded deeply into the sea, and at the periphery, at the edges, it did not intrude as much. This is what gave me the idea. And then to see also these moons flitting across Eric Lorentz's pages was just completely mind-blowing. Add to that the reading of Lacan's essay that follows chapter 7, and pow! What an image. I hope that this diagram work will prove useful to you. Let's start then with this high water mark, this high tide line that happens when the sea swells inland, when jouissance swells into its furthest point in the land known as knowledge. The edge of the hole in knowledge that Lacan talks about in chapter 7 of Seminar 18 is an edge that is outlined, sketched, and drawn by letters. It is, let me even be a little bit arch here, it is a line that is strewn with litter, the same way that the high water mark at the ocean is going to be strewn with litter, with debris, with shit that washes up, dead animals, kelp, old coolers, occasionally a body. It's California where I live. Sometimes bodies wash up, man. Here's the thing, though. This high water line, this curved mark into land, into knowledge, it's not just outlined, sketched, and drawn at the level of litter, by litter, namely letters. It's also measured and designated by science at the level of the formula, the diagram, the mathene, and the like. So this high tide, high water line that we're drawing, where the sea swells into the land, in other words, the right-hand side of the littoral zone in the diagram that we just drew, this high tide mark shows a whole series of letters, litter, strewn throughout and opportunities and occasions for the very measurements of those appearances that we've discussed as the work of psychoanalysis. Let's be clear, in keeping with what you've heard so far on this, the letters that define the high tide mark even when the tide is lower, as debris, as a line of debris, 
These are symptomatic expressions commanded by the unconscious. Remember this from last time. And the measurements and assessments of these symptomatic expressions are determined by the psychoanalyst. So the unconscious is what deposits debris at the high tide mark, and it's the psychoanalyst that then combs through it, assesses it, sometimes even from an aerial viewpoint. But let me ask you a question here. It's a question we didn't ask in our last lecture, but that has to be asked here. Where do these letters, where does this litter come from? It comes from the sea of sexual jouissance, qua prohibited, repressed, in other words, unconscious. Next question. How did all these letters, I mean all of this litter, get into the ocean? Does the ocean itself produce the trash that then washes up? Not typically, especially when it comes to man-made trash. Read pollution, read contamination, read the first few pages, first few paragraphs of chapter seven or Lacan's subsequent essayification of this lecture that he delivers. Yes, the debris that is the letter as extending from the unconscious and determined thereby comes from the sea of sexual jouissance. But that is not, in fact, its origin. The pollution, the contamination, the litter, the letters that wash up and lodge in land during high tide and remain there when high tide recedes, by God, they come from the field of society. They come from the symbolic. They come from civilization. It's the sewers of civilization, the litter produced by those living on land that washes out to sea and then washes back up, usually in hyper-degraded form. You put the plastic bottle in the river. What comes back are the plastic particles. In today's day and age, we know this all too well. I'm also indebted to some terrific work by another brother from another mother, Danny Nobis. He has done a terrific job of annotating and pulling together his own translation, in fact, of this essay form of chapter seven. And I'm also indebted to the queen of Brazilian psychoanalysis for pointing this out to me and saying, yo, don't forget about the essay after she saw the lecture that I just posted, our last lecture on the littoral zone all of which, again, contributes to this mind-warping experience that I'm trying to diagram here. The litter that washes up on the beach, from the surface of the sea to the high water mark, in a sense, what I'm trying to tell you is that it is returning home. It is returning to its source. It is going back to land. And in precisely the same way, the analyzans' symptomatic expressions as letters, not signifiers, utterances, but not words, come from the unconscious, but they actually originate in the symbolic, in the society, in civilization. Symptoms, don't get it twisted, they are effects of the unconscious. Ah, but as Lacan plainly says on page 7 in chapter 7, the unconscious, don't forget, is an effect of language, of society, of the symbolic. So symptoms are effects of the unconscious, and the unconscious is an effect of society, of language in particular. This is a radical reading of what Freud is doing in his 52nd letter to Fleece, which we've talked about earlier in the series, but also which Lacan mentions in chapter seven and his subsequent essayification of this thing. Symptoms are effects of the unconscious, but the unconscious is an effect of language. In much the same way, the debris that washes up ashore comes from the sea, but the sea itself receives that debris from land. Moving fast and furiously 
toward this littoral zone. Let's take another pass at it. The littoral zone, simply put, you don't need to be fancy with this shit. The littoral zone is a coastal zone. It's a domain established by the lines typically between a high water mark and a low water mark, between high tide and low tide. There are other more expansive ways to understand this, and you can work the littoral zone into all of its different subsets, but we don't have to do that in order to do the work that we have in front of us. The littoral zone is the domain in which symptoms wash ashore. And they wash ashore, again, as letters, not words, as enigmatic effects of signifying articulation, of the signifier, of language, of the symbolic. And here's the thing about symptoms. At the risk of saying too much and not enough, I'm going to tell you, they all say the same thing. Here, I can speak no further. Here, I am at my limit. Beyond this point, my discourse is abolished. Symptoms speak the same way, at least in this very foundational sense. At issue here, again, when symptoms wash ashore, is not the sexual rapport, but it's prohibition by the sexual law. That is what we encounter. That is what we hear pronounced at the level of the symptom. We've got other words for this, words that we've been developing since our last series. The delta of impotence in any given theory of discourse. The name of the real. The statement of impossibility. The declaration of one's own limit. These odd practices that are communicative, even if they are not significant, these are practices that point us to the littoral zone that we have right here between the sea and land. What we're dealing with in the littoral zone, again, is the part of truth that can be said, however swervingly and measured accordingly. A discourse that is not emitted by a semblance, nor sustained by semblance, is also at stake here. In other words, the very title of Seminar 18, on the possibility of a discourse that might not be a semblance, is also what we see in the littoral zone. What we see happening in the delta of impotence, when the name of the real is pronounced, when the real takes a name, when impossibility is stated, when one's limits are declared, when the symptom sounds off as it always does, saying, here I can speak no further. Beyond this point, my discourse is abolished. What we see here is a discourse that is not emitted by a semblance and one that is not sustained by semblance either. Absolutely crucial here. Because if you've got ears to hear, what we're on the verge of is what Lacan and Radiophony calls real discourse. The same real discourse with which we started this series. This is a discourse that finds expression in littoral zones between knowledge and jouissance, always as a break, as a rupture, as breakage, as cesura, in discourse, and I want to emphasize this straight out of Lacan, I'm not making this shit up, breakages in discourse that can only be produced by discourse. The delta of impotence that marks an impossibility, a breaking point, a limit, think of that triangle as a mountain range, between the truth that conditions the semblance of agency that enables someone to speak, here we're on the left side of Lacan's typology of discourse, and the product that results from their speech addressed to the other, here on the right. This mountain range between product and truth, between surplus enjoyment 
and the sexual enjoyment that its pursuit prohibits. This mountain range is a breaking point. This, indeed, is where the waves crash. And this breaking point only appears in discourse. I think Laurent is precisely right about this, and I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It's discourse, not literature, that allows for this breakage to find expression, to find expression in discourse itself. You can read this for your own. It's on page 16 of chapter 7. Track down the passage if you want to learn more. The key stake for us is the kind of discourse that we see popping on the beach, that we see popping in this littoral zone between knowledge and jouissance. And it is, again, I would call real discourse. Now, what does that mean? We hear it in this really nice riff from Radiophony, which Lacan records, writes, records, and has played over Belgian radio during Seminar 17. It is still with us here. It's the missing term, I think, in the first part of Seminar 18. What is real discourse? It's the name that the real takes in the field of signifying articulation. And at this point, I think it is worth focusing on some passages where we can see this happening, again from chapter 7, because we're not reading the essayification of chapter 7. We've been focused just on chapter 7. So if you've got the document in front of you, I'm on page 14, page 128 in the broader PDF. Notice this passage. It's one we reviewed before, but now we can hear again. Writing does not trace out the signifier. It only goes back to it by taking a name. But exactly in the same way as this happens to all things that have been named by the signifying battery after it has numbered them. So what happens in the field of writing at the level of the letter in the real, if you recall what Lacan then goes on to say in this jingle, writing the real, the letter on the one side, signifier on the other side in the symbolic. Put that in some Eulerian circles and you'll make a lot of headway. What we're working on is what happens in between there, in this relationship between the name and the real. And what happens when the real, at the level of writing, in the form of the letter, takes on a name in this field of signifying articulation. And that's what he has here, and also in the essay, about the way that writing takes a name. Writing as figure of the real takes on a name. Let me be clear. Real discourse, as we have been showing in the past few lectures, is writing. Not at the level of words, so much as at the level of letters. So you can see some examples of this. Formations of the unconscious, parapraxies. These are symptoms moving in the field of appearance determined by the unconscious, commanded by the unconscious, as Lacan puts it in chapter 7 here. But real discourse also finds expression in the field of analytic thought as measurement. It is also there in the measurement of these squiggly appearances, these torqued, troped, and tripped out expressions at the level of theory, at the level of the study of parapraxies by psychoanalytic theorists, here at the level of the mathem the formula, the diagram, and the like, you also see real discourse popping. Symptoms equal real discourse. Mathemes equal real discourse. And I'm putting this bluntly, again, always to keep the discussion going. Check out how Lacan writes this out on page 8 of chapter 7 which corresponds almost directly with something he says in the essayification of this chapter. Nothing of what I inscribed with the help of letters 
about the formations of the unconscious. In order to rescue them from the way Freud formulates, states them, more simply as facts of language, which in the essay form is instead written as effects of the signifier. It's a much cleaner rendition of this. He's not simply dealing with facts of language. He's dealing with effects of the signifier. So nothing of what I inscribed with the help of letters about the formations of the unconscious. So Lacan is using letters at the level of the mathem to write about formations of the, conscious, of the unconscious, which operate as a series of letters issued from the unconscious. In order to rescue them from the way Freud formulates, states them more simply as effects of the signifier. Nothing allows there to be confused, as has been done, the letter with the signifier. The letter is not a signifier. And so we really have to be careful when we talk about how the letter carries meaning, if it carries meaning, what it does even relative to meaning. Is the letter a signifier? No. Does it signify? Oddly. What I inscribed with the help of letters, Lacan continues, about the formations of the unconscious. So here you have real discourse at the level of Lacanian theory using letters to write and provoke further discussion about formations of the unconscious, which appear as a series of squiggly letters at the level of the symptom, at the level of the parapraxis, at the level of the slip. What I inscribed with the help of letters in Lacanian theory about formations of the unconscious at the level of symptomatic expression does not authorize making a signifier of the letter and of granting it what is more a primacy with regard to the signifier. This breakage, this detachment between the letter and the signifier is key. And it's one for us to keep an eye on. I want to see if Lacan continues with this thought in subsequent chapters in Seminar 18. I haven't read him yet. I'm looking forward to it, but I really like what he's doing here. I still find it bewildering in a highly productive way, but still bewildering. What happens when we tell the truth? That's what's at stake here. When analyzands and analysts tell the truth, they do so by dwelling in the letter, the letter as an effect of the signifier. Truth dwells in the letter. To tell the truth is to take up one's lodging in the letter. Language may be the house of being, but the letter is the home of truth and all who speak it. The letter let's be precise, is not the signifier, but instead the rupture of the signifier. The letter marks the rupture of the signifier. When the clouds part, recall Lacan on his jet ride home, when the clouds part, revealing landscapes beneath, what we see at the level of that landscape is an enigmatic writing, a series of indecipherable letters. This is what the landscapes look like when they break apart the clouds. And notice how he's working this in his description of the Japanese painting he was considering with all of its golden clouds. Is it that the landscapes break through the golden clouds or that the clouds separate, revealing the landscapes below? At the level of the letter, what we see is the rupture of the field of the signifier, a breaking into the field of semblance, where the clouds are forced apart. So much the worse for signifieds as well. Not just signifiers, but signifieds as well. What does the letter do to the signified? Lacan is clear on this point in chapter 7 and its essayification. 
The letter erodes, furrows, gullies, gouges, lacerates the signified. Why? Because the letter functions as an image, but not as a metaphor. What kind of image are we talking about here? It's an image of rain, pooling, gouging, coursing, streaming through a landscape. Here's the closest we come to a river. Toward bigger rivers. And eventually, you know where rivers head. Out to sea. Only to then wash back up on the beach. Along with all manner of litter. We talked about the high water mark. We riffed, as you just heard, on the littoral zone, this in between of this Eulerian diagram we're playing with. What about the low water mark? You got high tide down, you've got the littoral zone spoken once more in yet another different way, putting us on the scent of real discourse. What about this low tide mark? This low tide mark where land is most exposed. This other encroachment. What can we say about this? And what does this low water mark, this other curved tide line, represent for us in the field of psychoanalytic theory, perhaps even technique? Recall the key difference between the high tide mark and the low tide mark. And again, just think basically. Look up the littoral zone, read about it, and think basically about this. You don't need to be fancy to get what Lacan is saying. The high water mark, you've heard me say, is rarely inundated with water. But even when it is, it remains visible. High water lines are almost always visible. When the tide is up, the water that has risen to that level designates the high tide mark. It shows you the high tide mark. But check it out. Even when the tide is down, in decline, perhaps even at its lowest point, even when the tide is down, declining, and perhaps at its lowest point, the line of debris, litter, foam, kelp, pollution, trash, all the letters left behind by high tides past, allow that high water mark to remain legible. And that's just it. The high water mark that marks the edge of the whole in knowledge is always legible as long as you have eyes to see. Even readable, as Lacan says in his essay. Not so, however, when it comes to the low tide line. The low water mark in any given littoral zone. Check it out. It's almost always inundated with water, and thus obscure. The low tide line is almost always underwater, and typically that means obscure. It's only truly, accurately visible, and thus measurable, at low tide, when the sea recedes to indicate the beach's low water line. So that's just it. High water lines are almost always visible and easy to measure as a result. Low water lines only show up at low tide, where they quickly pass back into a rising tide, limiting the ability of us to measure these low tide marks. They are different in this way. In our terms, what we could say is the low tide mark represents the elusive, fleeting, and often obscured line between the real and its name, impossibility and its pronouncement, castration and its designation, the parts of truth that cannot be said 
and the parts of truth that can. That's how you should be reading the side of the Eulerian diagram we drew, labeled the C. The left-hand circle is one in which the outermost quadrant, or the outermost area, where you see sexual jouissance. This is an area of the real. In the part of that circle, though, that extends overlapping land and knowledge, this is where you see the name of the real. So all the way to the left, beyond the sphere of land, this is where you see the real. This is where you see impossibility. This is where castration resides. This is the part of truth that cannot be said. But when you enter the littoral zone from that sea, when the sea raises up, now you have entered into the field of the name, of the pronouncement, the designation, the part of truth that can be said. The low tide mark is what marks that limit, this elusive, fleeting, and often obscure line between the real and its name, sea and land. Measuring this curved parabolic line between the real and its name is much more difficult, I would wager, than measuring the relations between the name of the real and every other signifying articulation in the field of the symbolic. That's part of the point of the passage I shared with you from chapter 7 that I reiterated for you again. The real takes on a name in the field of the symbolic as it encroaches on this littoral zone in the same way that anything else takes on a name in the field of the symbolic. This is part of the dilemma. Letters are not signifiers, but the real sure as hell takes on a name, just like everything else in the field of the symbolic. That's a good one to sink your teeth into. What we're looking at here is the way that the real takes a name. And again, in exactly the same way as this happens to all things that have been named by the signifying battery. Again, page 14 in chapter 7 spells this out precisely. That's easy enough to assess. But measuring the outer limit of that experience, of that naming practice, Finding the line between the real and its name, this low tide mark, is much more difficult, much more difficult to measure than measuring the lines and correspondences between the real as named and the other signifiers in the field known as the symbolic. What then are we to do with this other name? You know the name I'm talking about. The name that Lacan writes on the blackboard when he stands up to give this seminar, this chapter 7 in seminar 18, which he also uses as the title for his later essayification of this chapter, Litura Terre. If you go to the opening page of chapter 7, you can again see right on the front, the very first word, litura terre. He's written it on the blackboard. What are we to make of this name? It's an interesting one. You've got two words coming together. Litura, meaning erasure, deletion, erosion, and also, Danny Nobis is great on this, a suggestion of some kind of visible deletion that remains. The deletory process has left some sort of a remain there. I tend to side more on the point of erasure, because Lacan, remember, is marking a very clean distinction, but it's a difficult one, between the effacement that objet a represents and the erasure that we see at the level of the horizontal bar. We'll come back to that in a second. For now, I think it's easier to think of Latura as erasure. And terra, that looks familiar to you, right? Terrain, it's earth. The word that we have here is a mashup of the Latin for erasure and earth. 
what we could call, following Danny Nobis, eraser land. The littoral zone is an erasure land between sea and land. How? Why? How exactly and why precisely is the littoral zone an erasure land? Recall once more this bit between effacement and erasure. Effacement, as you know, as we've discussed in our previous lecture, is well represented by the basic Lacanian math. 1 plus 1 equals 0. Phi minus phi equals obje a. Where obje a is always a trace left behind by the castrative process represented by minus phi. Little a is a symbol of the absence that remains, that is left over after phi has been subtracted, after castration has occurred. The imaginary phallus's subtraction leaves a trace. An absence remains, a zero point marked by the zero that we would redefine as obje a. Obje a is the symbol for the absence that remains after the subtractive logics of the, we can just call it the paternal function, has occurred. Here, you can think about a river coursing its way through a Siberian landscape. You want to figure out the difference between what Lacan is doing with the river and the Siberian landscape and the littoral zone as a coastal phenomenon? This just might be it. The river that courses through the landscape is like obje a in the field of castration. It's a symbol for the absence that remains after the imaginary phallus has been subtracted. And what it leaves is a streak across the Siberian landscape that reflects the sun and shows you a stain on an otherwise pretty indistinct plane. Not so when it comes to erasure. The effacement that obje a marks is different from the erasure that we see occurring in the littoral zone, not at the level of the river, although rivers wide enough, for those of you that live near the Mississippi, can have waves of their own and their own high and low tides. A river that dumps into the sea can also have a high and low tide effect. So don't get it twisted. But effacement does not equal erasure. Erasure is something different. It points not to a river coursing through a landscape, but to a coastal zone. The erasure in question here is a blotting out, you've heard me say, of the trace that remains after castration. The same way, check this out, that the horizontal bar in the agent over truth part of Lacan's four-footed theory of discourse allows for a semblance of agency, mastery, autonomy, when in fact the truth of the subject, lack, Incompletion, castration, lingers on below. So you can think very clearly at the level of the discourse of the master. Look at the left-hand side of that four-footed characterization. You've got the semblance of mastery, the S1, above not the barred subject. No, man. The S1 is above the bar itself, the line that divides S1 from the barred subject. That's what you see. The agent, the semblance of agency, depends upon the erasure, that is the effect of that bar, the erasure of the truth beneath it. You see, barred subjectivity is the cause of which the ego, mastery, conscious waking speech, the S1s of the world in all their swarms are effects they are effects of a more primordial cause. And yet they delude themselves in thinking that they are instead prime movers themselves. That they are the ones who speak and make the world work. That they are the cause of other effects. This is the delusion of the master, one of the main ones. They think they speak and the world works just as God spoke the world into existence. But the truth 
is that they themselves and their capacity to speak are effect structures of a more primordial cause known as castration, known as loss and lack, the production of a barred subject. All of that, though, is placed under erasure, under the erasure mark, the signifier, no, let me rephrase, the letter of erasure that the horizontal bar represents. Now, that's a little weird, but it gets at Lacan's point. The signifier does not stand atop the signified. It stands atop a letter that looks like a horizontal bar, a horizontal bar that at the level of this mapheme functions as a letter. And the letter erases what would otherwise have remained an effacement. At stake here, in this erasure, at the level of the neurotic subject, is a line. Specifically, you can play with this the way Lacan does too, a train line. A train line that can only be caught. A train which can only be taken insofar as it, this line, this train, this train line is detached from another line. The line that runs through each of us, striking us out, namely the unary trait. So the unary trait, Lacan tells us in chapter 7, as we've heard, is always vertical. The unary stroke is a vertical slash. The letter in question that works at the field of erasure in littoral zones is horizontal. And this is what he's playing with here, especially in the essay when he's using the word train and meaning line as well. He says you can only catch this train, this horizontal line. You can only rely upon it. You can only climb aboard the bar the way every agent climbs aboard the bar in Lacan's theory of discourse. You can only do this in the field of mastery in particular by detaching this experience from another line. Not the line that props you up as a subject, but the line that strikes you out as a split subject. That's what you see in the position of truth beneath the bar in the left-hand side of Lacan's theory of discourse. And that's what he's messing with here. The train line that the master catches can only be caught insofar as the master is willing to ignore and place under erasure the other line that cuts through him, that strikes him out, namely the unary trait, the castrative logic that bars the subject, which you see very clearly in Lacan's Discourse of the Master. In the position of truth, there is a capital S for subject with a more or less vertical line striking through it. The master can only ride the train of mastery insofar as he ignores this other line that strikes him out. Let's keep going with this and just see where we land. In order to ride the horizontal line toward a semblance of agency, mastery, and the like, you have to detach, ignore, repress, its condition of possibility, the cause of which it is merely an effect, namely the truth of castration, constraint, inconsistency, incompletion, and the like. Again, represented by the vertical line that you see in the discourse of the master in the position of truth that strikes out the subject. But let's not take too many more steps in this direction for fear of slipping and missing our train. This erasure poem of subjectivity doesn't last long. Even trains, no matter how straight the line is cut into the mountain, must eventually swerve. Nothing in nature moves in a straight line, even train lines. And here's the thing. Train lines, like all horizontal lines, they always swerve in the same direction, Lacan suggests. Away from words, away from the words of conscious, agential, egocentric speech, and instead toward the letters 
that appear in between these words, like landscapes appearing in between clouds, calling our attention to a curvy, non-linear domain. This is the domain known as the littoral, where lines are curvy, not straight. And what I'm telling you here is, even the train that is this erasure poem that begins as the horizontal bar, the line atop which the semblance of agency sits, even this line swerves towards the literal, the littoral, is made to swerve by the letter. And I want to tell you that I think it's only here, in the littoral zone, where enigmatic script, bewildering letters appear at the behest of the unconscious, not the ego, mind you. It's only here that I think something might, that might be called true agency can be found. And I don't care for this true agency. I'm toying with the idea that underneath the semblance of mastery that we see in the discourse of the master, there is truth and a different kind of agency, namely the agency of the unconscious at work. And I want to suggest that this is a kind of true agency that Lacan is making space for in chapter 7. I think it's only here, but I'm trying to tell you that it's only here, on the beach, where nothing lasts because everything erodes. It's only here where nothing lasts and everything erodes, but we never stop fucking building shit. This is here the place where we become. And what we become, I believe, in the littoral zone, is what we've always been. Furrows in the sand. The truth that the master cannot handle is that there's nothing permanent about him. There is nothing primal about him. Nothing lasts. He, like the rest of us, is nothing but a furrow in the sand. The question I want to end with, though, is this. What is psychoanalysis in all of this? If the truth of the subject is that he, like the traces he leaves on the beach, is nothing but a furrow in the sand, what is psychoanalytic theory? What is analytic thought for all of this? I don't have an answer to this question, but I think we get some clues when we recall Lacan's plane ride and this emphasis on maps being drawn aerially from above. I can't help but wonder, in light of this emphasis we've been giving to the littoral, to this coastal zone of high tides and low tides, if what we might have here at the level of psychoanalysis, at the level of psychoanalytic theory, the math themes, the diagrams, the formulas, what else is all of this when they rain down from the skies but a series of tide tables? You know what a tide table is? It's this book that you can get. You buy a new one every year or so, and it tells you the times at which low and high tide in your particular area will be experienced. Maybe psychoanalytic theory is like the tide table that people who live on the coast use when they decide whether or not they're going to go backpacking on the beach, try and round a certain point before the tides come in. Perhaps this is what psychoanalysis does, is it just helps us wend our way down the beach. Ankle and occasionally knee deep in the sea, but never being quite washed out and never being quite dashed against the rocks.